myself. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Yep. All right. All right. I'm so happy to be here uh, to give all of you guys a super brief uh, background to this. This is a very, very simple show. Um, I just finished an album, released it, and I'm working on the next one. And I figured I could use some tips. The tips are mostly about inspiration, about mic placement, song choices, but it comes down to getting a certain mm, in the studio that it's very, very, very difficult to capture. So I figured I'd call some people and see if I can roam their brains. So the, our guest today, Dom, how are you? How is everything? I'm very good, thank you. All good over All here. All right, I'm so happy to have you. Good to be here. Uh, so I got to ask you, did you really send her to, to, uh, to rehab and she, did you really say no, no, no? Is that a true story? Apparently, yeah. So I wasn't there for the songwriting process, but apparently... Uh, she <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, I'm joking. she walked so... to Mark and said, <laughs> and literally said the line, they told me to go to rehab. And I said, no, no, no. And Mark was like, that's a song. Let's start with that. So there yeah, you apparently go. There you that is, go. yeah. <laughs> so I have, I have a few questions, but let's get the important things first. How are you guys, are you guys safe? How have you guys been dealing with this the last six months? Um, okay, actually, you know, so this, uh, my room, which you can kind of see, that this is where I, I work out of, and it's like a detached kind of brick barn uh, behind a really big old, almost stately home, like massive house in, in the middle of nowhere. I call it um, Tolkien country, because this is like, um, you know, Tolkien taught at Oxford University, and this is the area that you could imagine hobbits. Nice, yeah, nice. So, so I'm kind of isolated. I'm more isolated at work than I am anywhere else. So I've just been able to keep coming in and, and working. Um, the only I, I feel, I've, got, I've got three I kids. I feel the same way. Uh, like, right. like when they when they impose quarantine here, I was like, I'm a jazz musician. I'm a guitarist. I've been quarantining my whole life. Just give me a guitar yeah. in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mix what engineers. a lucky form as it is. Life. Yeah. Mix engineers do so, this every day. So. so three albums that inspired you during this time, you know, we had a lot of time to listen to music. Okay. Uh, i tell you what I've been listening to, weirdly, I don't know why, I got into the Cocteau Twins again. So I've gone back ah. to Cocteau Twins. Probably Heaven of Las Vegas is the one I've listened to more of. Um, also, uh, uh, I really like Alessandro Cortini. And there's his, uh, who's a no, Berliner as well, actually. He lives in Berlin now. Um, ah, cool. So uh, he's the keyboard player from Nine Inch Nails for people who don't know. Ah, hook me up. Yeah, his... Um, Mainly his... because we, we've been here for a year. I don't really know anyone. I mean, I have two okay. friends. Both of them are you, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, well, he's, uh, his, his stuff I really like is like his own stuff is really kind of big, expansive keyboard synth soundtracky stuff. Um, and then another one I just discovered recently, which I'm really pleased about discovering. So I really like the Portishead album, Third. Um, yeah. Which, you know, quite out there, but I love it. And um, and I've never found anything that sort of, that felt like it was a thread to that. You know, like something they might have been listening to that made them then make those tracks and those sounds. And then I just recently discovered the band Silver Apples, who are from, I think, the 60s or 70s. Um, and their album, Silver Apples, it sounds, you can hear... Porter said we're definitely listening to that when they made third. So I'm really pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. It's okay. good. So, and when you listen to music, how do you do that? Streaming, CDs, vinyl? What's um, what's your take on that? Well, I've it's a good question because another thing that I've done in um, since we've been locked down and stuff is I've got back into vinyl. So I've, I've finally bought a cartridge for my uh, my turntable because the cartridge had broken years ago. Bought a cartridge. Which, which, did, which did you get? Uh, I've got so I've got a Riga P3, and it huh? was oh, I've forgotten the name of the cartridge. It was about three hundred quid or something like that. I, I was I was trying to decide between the Riga and the the P3, or but I went for the clear audio uh, concept, which is yeah. more yeah. or less the same. But I upgraded the tone arm and the cable, and then I upgraded the the, the cartridge, and from, you know one thing led to another. That's how it works. I owe some people some money and we'll put it at that. Right, yeah. So you upgrade one thing and then you hear like 
it'd actually be better if I because then I bought another phono amp that would be better. And now I'm thinking I could get exactly. some bigger speakers. Exactly, bigger exactly, speakers. exactly. Yeah. So and you buy your vinyl used, new, like like you hunt for it. What's what's the deal? Well, I, I've managed it. So I've got a few kicking around from over the years, you know, that I didn't get rid of, even though I wasn't really playing them. So I've got a few of those. And then I've just been, the stuff that I've bought more lately has just been new things. Like there's a friend of mine called St. Saviour. Her album came out last week. So I bought that one on vinyl, which is great. What's your name? St. Saviour. Um, ah. She actually got the, the album of the day on uh, BBC Six Music today, which is a really cool thing. So, Very so good cool. her. That's her third record. She sang on, on some stuff for me a while back. And we've been friends for years and years and years. So. Ah, I'll check it out. Yeah, so that's um, that's really nice. She's got an incredible voice, really beautiful voice. Um, and then I've been buying other things, like I bought the the Alessandro Cortini Avanti thing from a while back, just because I wanted it on vinyl now, and, yeah. and uh, a couple other things like that, just so I have it on vinyl because it's nicer, you know. So, uh, and I bought the a Pixies box set years ago, which has got loads of like, artwork and all sorts of stuff, and then a lot of really good vinyl. So I've been playing that a lot as well. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I've been I've been. I've been waiting every day for my girlfriend to leave the ho- leave the house so right. I can crack the volume to the point where the blood is coming out of the kitty's ears and the walls are like vi- it's like a vibrating one vibrating cell. Yeah. But yeah. uh yeah there's really nothing like quite like it. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. So I have a few idea a few a few questions. Okay. In the album that just came out um I'd love to send you one by the way. Yeah, um, I feel that, and I'm sure that every guitarist feels this way. I'm, I'm not getting exactly the sound that I want. Okay. And I never know if it's just a matter of keep playing with the equipment. Is it like, is it, is it, is it the guitar that I? I mean, what's your take? Is it changing a cable and changing a pickup, or is it mic placement? What do you usually do just to get like your ideal? Yeah. I sort of start from the beginning, really, as in start from the pickup, play with those options and make sure we're getting as close to what we want with the pickup. And then the next thing is you go to the amp or the pedals if they've got some pedals going on. And and just at each stage, play with the different elements that you've got and go, okay, that's, you know, I've put, say, an overdrive pedal in and I've played with that. So I've got the best out of the overdrive. So now I know I'm on the right pickup the overdrive pedal is the right thing. So now I'm going to go to the amp and I'm going to play with that until coming out of the amp. That's do you have, do you have fav- after all these years, do you have favorite amps? Uh, to be honest, the only one I have in my studio um, that's just the one sort of standard one that I have kicking around is there's the um, the PV5150, which because I had a deal with wow. PV a little while ago and they gave me that. Um, yeah, so that's that a was, classic. Yeah, it's a great amp, you know, and... Um, Occasionally, you know, people will come down that, that bring their own amps, so then we get that plugged in and use that instead. If anyone wants, you know, obviously I'm up for what anyone's sound is, but if if anyone is not particularly, you know, tied to, you know, I have to use an AC30 or I have to use a Marshall or whatever, and they just turn up, then, you know, I can normally get what I want out of the 5150. It is, you know, it's a great amp and it makes, it's, it's versatile it's a legendary enough. Amp. I, I think want. especially our generation grew up on that sound. Yeah, when Eddie just came out with it, and then uh, Allison Chain started using it. A lot of people started using that amp. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. For like a pilot of ten years, uh, it was like, and it's still. We have we have one right next door, and I haven't used it once because I'm a jazz guy. But yeah, um, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> a bit and much. You, you usually you turn how loud is the amp for you to get to get this for you to get the sweet sweet spot on like one to ten or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of not around the middle to to push like six or seven, maybe around there. I've got a power soak, so I don't kind of blow people away before uh, to the. Before which get to one the, do you uh, use? Hold on, I'm gonna have a look. <laughs> uh, a Weber Mass Two Hundred is. Does that make uh, sense? That one. Yeah, it sounds good. It sounds cool. good. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm. I'm and favorite mics to you to to make a, a, a guitar amp? Uh, I like uh, the Royer, you know, the Royer 121. I think that's a nice ribbon. Um, I sort of used a Coles a lot, but I slightly prefer the Royer. I think it's got a little, a, a touch more brightness than the Coles on an yeah. amp. Um, 
And then I have a um, Audix i5 as well, which is like their their 57. I just, okay. you know, to me, the two are interchangeable. I just happen to have an i5 and that's what I've got stuck out there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. For my money, every time I try to mix another, uh, every time I try to mix another mic with the 57, I almost never use it. And it's not because we're unsure. It's, I just haven't, I guess it's between my ear being used to that sound. Yeah. To, yeah. I mean, I just never, I, I was never able to get something that sounded better for the room or for better well, for the whatever. The thing is, it's that question. It's a bit like the kind of I, the question about lexicon and reverb is that does lexicon make the best reverbs or have we just heard lexicon and reverb so exactly. much that to us that exactly. sounds like a record? And it's the same with like a fifth, sure, 57 on a snare or on a guitar cab. Is that the best sound or is that just the sound of a record to us now? Because exactly. we've heard exactly. it so much. So, Actually, um, yeah. I've been working with, uh, I've been working with Gibson guitars for a while. Nice. And um, they, it turns out that to get that sound, you have to have a Gibson. I mean, yeah. they, the distance between the different notes in the guitar, which is called frets, whoever is interested, Mm -hmm. are just so specific and specifically not perfectly in tamper tuning just I to get it. super specific but it's right. just it's such a specific sound and yeah. you just cannot get it anywhere else but then yeah. i just went through another rabbit hole and i found a 1953 jazz box in the in 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 like uh you know it's like there's no original parts but the wood has been blah 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 yeah and it's coming in tonight and then i'm going wow. to restore it but really get the old sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So next question. Uh, you have the perfect sound. Okay. Uh, what's your take on getting the best performance out of your guy? I mean, are you a first take guy, a 13th take guy, uh, a, a bottle of wine sort of thing in a session, or or, or no, let's just keep wine. coffee and keep folk? <laughs> <laughs> Coffee, coffee, definitely less wine. Um, it all depends what you what you're looking for. So I want to know from the band, which generally, if I'm producing, by the time we've got to doing overdubs and guitars and stuff, I probably know already. But I want to know what emotion I'm supposed to be feeling when I hear this. You know, when I hear the track, I see the job as producer is kind of audience ground zero. So you, I'm sitting there thinking I'm supposed to be feeling this by what I'm hearing him play. Am I feeling it yet? So. I sort of, I approach it with that and then I will go however many takes it requires in order to get that feeling. And what I'm doing while I'm, while I'm doing this is I'm using different adjectives to say to the, the whoever's playing, um, can you make it a bit more excited, yeah. angry, aggressive, whatever adjective it is. And eventually I'll hit on one that to that player means the thing that makes them hit it the right way so that as an audience member i feel the thing i'm supposed to feel and That's to be honest i have once with the guitarist he was he was a really chilled guy he was lovely and um and he had to do quite an aggressive part and it wasn't quite natural to him so in the end i ended up getting a pencil and i have everybody sat next to me i, I don't have a booth or anything i like being in the same room and every time i felt the aggression aggression drop off a little bit i just poked him in the leg with a pencil <laughs> And I think I think he got quite annoyed, but he did do it. Like it, then it was great because the aggression never dropped because he was getting angrier and angrier. <laughs> but it worked. So, it, it worked. So I'm going back one step. You said when you're overdubbing guitar, you, yeah. are you a uh, everyone live in the same room kind of guy, or you want people rhythm section first and then the guitarist and the vocalist, or everyone's completely separated? What? I tend to do it so that. Um, yeah, so we do, we, we concentrate on people individually. So when we record the drums, you've got as many people as possible in the room so that it's as much as a live recording as possible. Yeah. And then I'll normally keep the parts that we've recorded from anyone else and then see if we can get them better by going over it again, more focused, sat next to me in the control room rather than in the live room with headphones on. And... It's not always, but normally I can get a better performance out of somebody in that situation. Ah, than interesting. The live room. Sometimes it's a case of chopping between the two. You know, like I, there was a track I was mixing the other day, which is something that I produced, 
and and the bass was a bit of a challenge because it was half bass in the room. You know, the cab had the room the room noise of the drums on it, and yeah. then it was chopped in between with that and and not because it was a bit half and half between the the stuff in the room and the stuff we'd done in the control room afterwards. So I, I'm open to whatever's better, you know. But I will always try. We'll always have a go at an overdub and see if that that gets a better result. All right, I'm I'm gonna ask last couple of technical questions just because it's my chance to kind of yeah yeah uh, when you're mixing how loud how soft uh I, I mix quietly and there is there are two reasons for that um i mix quietly because i want to protect my ears because i mostly mix and if i'm doing it really loud then my ears are going to get trashed what what exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i don't want to be that guy um and secondly when things are loud they're exciting like they're automatically exciting so I want it to be quiet and exciting. I see that's kind of the job of the mix is to make it exciting at any at any volume. So you kind of fool yourself a bit when you turn it up that it's like, wow, it sounds great. Um, but you need to hear that, feel that when it's down quiet as well. So. And, and you compare, I'm assuming you compare different monitors, any favorite ones? Um, I've got uh, Neumann, um, what are they called? 310s, which I really like. Right. And... Um, uh, NS10s, you know, the standard Yamaha NS10s, um, which are the main ones. I have a pair of Aventones as well, which are like the old Auratone thing. So I have those two. And then I've got, I use Grado headphones quite a lot as well, the SR325s, I think they are. Grado 325s, which I use a lot. I find them really, really useful. Um, and I've recently got a pair of Focal headphones, the Clear Pros, which I'm getting into using. So um, Yeah, I've I hear got... they're very specific. Yeah, yeah, they're very, yeah, they're 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 very good. Um, I'm just not as used to them yet as I am to the other stuff. So, you know, have a little bit of a go, have a listen, see if I can hear something I haven't heard on the other things. I always, I always feel, I'm such a touring guy. Yeah. At least I was until 2020. Yeah. And uh, that that for me, I the thing that sounds the best, the thing that I know the most, like the guitar that I know the most, I'm the most comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm going to sound the best, you know, I'm just going to yeah. sound the best, you know, no matter if, if you never get a better sounding, whatever, on another different guitar. Yeah, um, so it reminds me that the first session I ever did that I assisted on was um, was one for Tony Iommi. And um, he obviously had a, a lot of Gibsons, you know, in the room. Yeah. Uh, but he had one that he referred to as number one which was like the one that he'd had for so many years. And the paint classic had one, classic mostly one. come off because it had been set on fire a few times. And I think they're just reissuing it. Oh, that really? exact replica of that, I think, okay. I think they just, yeah. there's a very, very cool, uh, I just saw a very, very cool thing with him. He's, he's kind of amazing. But yeah, he's absolutely. talking about Tony Iommi and uh, Back in Black or Back to Black. You're working with someone like that where... His, he played things that everyone, you, you go to Nicaragua or you go to, you know, Tokyo, people know yeah. that sound. And yeah. I mean, and you're, you say it's your first session. Yeah, that was pretty mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was what pretty mind like? like, put put me in that space for a sec. Uh, I know the, th the thing is, it's pretty mind blowing, but, you know, he's a nice guy. You know, he's, it was him and Glenn Hughes was singing and Don Airy from, um, Rainbow was he from? It was on keyboards, and you know it was it was a bit of a super group because it was Tony Iommi and some friends, but they're right. all really nice people. So it's, it made it quite easy to just settle in and and me to just get on and do my job, you know. And then it was my first session, so it was just make cups of tea, make sure the engineer had everything that he needed, and just wait, wait. Of... at a certain at a certain age in Tony Iommi's life, it goes to tea from hardcore drugs. That's what you're telling me. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. I presume he probably, I mean, I imagine in the 70s a bit of that was involved, but no, that wasn't, he was very sensible. So, so I'm continuing with that line of yeah. questioning. Yeah, okay. Uh, you go into a session and it's fucking Amy Winehouse and you make an album and it's yeah. album of the year, the Grammys, and every kid anywhere in the world sings those songs. Uh, my first, my first, uh, the first time I heard the songs were, I just moved back to Tel Aviv from New York and I needed any gig that came in. 
mm-hmm. and someone call me and see if I can produce something for her. And she, she, she goes to the piano and she's singing those songs. And I didn't, I haven't heard them before. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not getting this. Right. And then I went home and listened to that album for the first time. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. 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 So what is the difference? Explain to me from hearing it's the same fucking songs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. The reason why is because I noticed something recently and it was about the idea of somebody's favorite song, right? When someone says my favorite song is X, um, I think they don't normally mean that. They mean my favorite production. And the reason why is because I, I had always said my favorite song since being a teenager, right, was a, a track called Where Is My Mind by the Pixies, right? That's right. the track that made me want to start a band and when I was 14 and, and everything. And it's, I still love it. And then I heard a few people cover it and I thought, oh, I don't like that. And then I thought, well, how can I not like it if it's my favorite song? So, because then the song's still the same. As you discover, you know, you're sitting there hearing somebody do a song with a piano and I think, no, nah, it's okay. And then you hear the production and go, this is amazing. So I think if you, um, it's worth thinking about that with, with anyone, little thought experiment, anyone think their favorite song is it may not be. And in which case, I think, because I'm not a massive country fan, it's okay, but it's not something I particularly get into. But I love Wichita Lineman. So maybe Wichita yeah, Lineman yeah, yeah, yeah. is my favorite song because I love it, even though the production isn't necessarily my thing. Yeah. So um, I think that's the thing when people hear, you, when you're hearing a song, you're actually hearing the whole production when you're hearing a record and, and everything is feeding into your love of it. You know, the mood that's been created and all the different parts that come out in the mix at the right time, you know, those things are all propelling your love of the song. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's also, I think, that's interesting about, you know, when people mix is that, that they don't realise how important um, how important a mix is because people will define the song and their love of the song by the mix. Like, I had another good story. I, I've got loads of these stories. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was with my brother once and, and there was a Black Eyed Peas track came on the radio. Was it Black Eyed Peas? No, Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? And he likes the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And he said, I don't like this song. And I was thinking, yeah, it sounds kind of, you know, it's Red Hot Chili Peppers sort of stuff. It's, it's standard thing. But the mix was really weird. The, the vocal was really loud and it was separated from the rest of the track. It was an odd kind of thing going on. And I said, it, it, it's just a weird mix. Like the vocal's really loud. It sounds odd on the radio. And he went, oh, yeah, 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 the song's all right. But actually, that is that is weird. And because he doesn't work in music, you know, he would never make the connection that it's actually the mix he didn't like. So he says, I don't like this song. I think that's I worth bearing in mind uh, for engineers and everybody that how important it is because everyone will judge the song based on how they heard it, which is the production and the mix and everything else. I think I think that's something that's not really spoken about at all. Uh, mm. I know that many of my favorite, favorite albums were they had a mix and they were almost going to print, but then they changed their mind. And then, you know, so, so many albums, it could be, it could be uh, uh, Appetite for Destruction or it could be U2's Arthur and Baby. Yeah. yeah. They were mixed by three different people and they compared the mixes. And I mean, like sometimes, uh, a band would finish or finish an album. Someone just sent me an album a couple of days ago and asked me to pass it to Ropido. And I said, listen, I could, but this mix is gonna kill you. The right. mix and the mastering. Yeah. No one, I mean, you can hear that someone doesn't understand the genre. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And the yeah. impact that it's supposed to have. Yeah. Um, so I'm going back to I'm going back to Amy Winehouse. Okay. She's there at the vocal booth. You yeah. hear it through the monitors. Yeah. What does it sound like? You know what? It was, I was shocked by Amy. And I work with, you know, I've been very fortunate and I've worked with some amazing singers and some people that, you know, have been, you know, very famous for this. Like the only people that I'd worked with that I thought she was, that were as good as her were people like Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart, Roger Daltrey, you, <laughs> uh, people, but Just the point was people that had been doing it for 40 years longer than ah. I'd been doing it. And, and just the ability to walk in 
and just deliver an incredible performance without any need to get into it, to warm up. That takes so many years of practice. And she yeah. had it at 26. It just didn't make sense to me. Because I'm not a big believer in in talent. I think talent is just practice. Neither do I. Neither do lots I. of practice. I the mean, people that I mean, are the most talented are the ones that practice more than everybody else. So I'm not a believer in, in talent and I'm not a believer in inspiration. Yeah, inspiration just... I heard a great quote. It was Picasso. I think it was Picasso said, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. <laughs> That's a really good one. Yeah, so he would just go in every day and paint, and eventually something would come to him. But he would go in and work. You know, he would just work. It's habit. Habit's yeah, yeah, more my, important than inspiration. My favorite one, and I forget who said that, but I keep stealing it, is um, inspiration is, is for kids. The rest of us just show up and go to work. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, that, so that was the thing. So Amy came in. I only worked on one lead vocal, which was a track called He Can Only Hold Her, because she was around the world and Mark was around the world. So things got recorded in a lot of different places. So I only did one lead vocal, which was the track He Can Only Hold Her. And um, she basically did three takes. They were all amazing in a slightly different style. Yeah. And then, and then I remember turning to Mark and going, I don't know how you pick. Like, what do you do with that? Like, they're all great. You've just got to pick a style. Mad. Mad. And and that's it. Three takes and she's home. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was unbelievable. I really haven't worked with anyone like that. And, and you know, I've obviously worked with some great people, but but that good at 26. Wow. 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 Nobody. Nobody. It was amazing. So I'm going to Chasing Pavements, that whole album. What was the process? What was it like in the studio? I think she, from what I'm understanding as a fan, mm -hmm. she she also seems like a first, second take sort of sort of person, and it kind of seems like that just she opens her mouth and that's the way it is. Which yeah. Well, so I only worked. So I was. This was all the time I was Mark Ronson's engineer in London, basically. So we only did a, a, a one track on that album, which is called Cold Shoulder. Um, but that was you know, with her and a band and all, you know, and everybody. And um, and she wasn't quite Amy good at that stage. I mean, this was her first album, if you remember, and that was Amy's yeah. second. Um, but she was very, very good. Um, it was clear that, you know, she was she was excellent. She wasn't a normal singer. Um, and And she was also exceptionally lovely and down to earth and very nice. What what you can the impression that you get from her of her being yeah. just a down to earth girl from South London is that's what she was absolutely so that was nice and then it's always great when people like that you know take off as as you know not many people take off as much as Adele did but uh, you know it's great to see them get the success that they deserve and 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 could you hear that in the studio for those two albums could you be in the studio and say, and say to yourself I think this is going to explode or it's all just random. No, I don't. I I don't think anybody can really. Be. And the reason why is because you also work on great stuff that doesn't explode, and and it's there's so many things have to be right for. Give an me album. an example. When you say so many things, let's 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 explore that. Okay, so so you have to you start with a great song, you have to have a great performance from everybody. You have a great mix, you know. So then you've got a great record. And then what you need is a really good manager. Hopefully, if you've got management, they have to be great. You have to have really good radio pluggers to get it on the radio in the right places. You have to have good PR. Uh, you have to have all of that, plus a little bit of luck along the way that helps people pick up on your record. And it's really about those great records finding the audience that they deserve, which that doesn't always happen. As I'm sure anybody who's worked in it long enough has, has come across those records or worked on those records that they knew were great and they just didn't happen for whatever reason. Um, and and so when they do, things like Amy's album, Adele's album, stuff like that, when they do, it's like all the more uh, all the more great for you that, you know, that you did this great thing and everybody got to hear it. So that's fantastic. Yeah, but I also, I'm also a strong believer in, 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 the, in the sense that true greatness finds this way it might take time i mean there's always that story of the first pat metheny album bright size life on ecm records mm -hmm. and 
he kept he keeps saying that when that album came out, no one was listening. I mean, it was they played to like four people on at, at the gigs. Yeah. yeah. And now it's in the Smithsonian as part of like the hundred albums of of the right. you know the century. Yeah. God knows. Yeah. Uh, That's actually, sometimes it might take a minute. Yeah, there's a good parallel actually with. Um... As I mentioned earlier, the Pixies. So I, I, I was, you know, a fan of them as a kid, and um, I remember seeing so the Boss and Overtour. That was their fourth album, and they did one night at, at Hammersmith, which is a mid-sized venue in in London. One night there, saw that gig when I was that was the first gig I went to. Abs, you know, great. But then they came back after about twenty years off, and they just snowballed. And then they instead of one yeah. night in Hammersmith. They did four nights at Brixton, which is twice the size. And, and it was just, for some reason, that was more their time than it was before. And just fortunate that they had enough going on in their lives that they were able to come back and, and, and take advantage of the, you know, the fandom that had built up in their time away. So you, you're right, there's, everything's got a chance of, of having its time and sometimes it takes a long time. And then it's just a case of can the musicians still be there? Are they still, are they still doing it? at that point, you know, when, when it lands. I actually, I went to see, three years ago, I went to see the Guns N' Roses reunion tour. Yeah, okay. And it was an absolute, uh, I don't even know what to call that thing. I, you know, I, I always thought that the big, the greatest concerts that I've seen were Keith Jarrett playing solo at Carnegie. I saw, Sonny Rollins do some things that you don't think are even possible to a really, really large festival crowd. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Rafa Marsalis at a, at a small place, the, the Village Vanguard in New York, which is super small. Okay. So I'm thinking that what, that what it was like to see Colton or something. Uh, but then I went to see Guns N' Roses and it's, it felt like, like you'd go to the safari in Africa and you see wild animals at their habitat. Right. Functioning, doing what the, what animals do. I mean, it right. wasn't. You never got a sense that it's a person playing an instrument, or a person doing something. It just seemed like. You know what I mean? Like, I I see I see Bono, and yeah. I, you know, and I'm a huge YouTube fan, and yeah. you see a person taking a vocal, taking a mic and singing. Yeah. And you see Ed, who I think is a motherfucking genius. Yeah. And you see him holding this there and picking this there. But those bunch of motherfuckers, what they've done to 90,000 people, I was, it wasn't, it wasn't human beings. Right. It was right. like, the, it was, it was like seeing a wild beast. Right. Ravaging. It, it, it was really like, they're, be, they're, it's like when actors say you become the part. Right. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's like that Jim Carrey thing on 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 uh, Andy Kaufman. Right. <laughs> it became, it's like it, it was that thing. Um, and I'm I'm assuming it was so much better than you, you can see the videos. I also saw them in '93 when I was a kid. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was better now than then, was it? I mean, a million times better. Right. Great. That's cool. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, so I'm going to another project that's actually super dear to my heart, the Sting Project. Because okay. that album and the one that the, the studio album, If I Want a Winter's Night, mm. it, it was produced by my really my musical father, by Robert Satan, uh, okay. the conductor, the producer, and the, um he really raised me musically and otherwise. Uh yeah. And so I really know every little note on that album. Right. Every yeah. cello part. Um, um, so when you're there in person, what does it sound like? Well, so I did the 5.1 mix of that one, um, of the live, live at Durham Cathedral. You yeah. know, they recorded a whole, a whole gig there. And it was beautiful. And I didn't, I didn't know the record anyway. Um, and I'd worked with Sting before. Um, so... So I kind of knew what the vibe was, but it was just it was just a beautiful thing to hear it, especially because I heard it in five point one. So you're more yeah. there, you know what I mean? It's even more real and and um, yeah, and beautiful and lush and everything. So um, yeah. 
so that was yeah it was a, a really great experience mixing that one that was that was cool and i was working with a guy called donal hodgson who does who'd worked with him for years as as his engineer so um he was kind of setting it up and then i was sort of doing the five one version of uh, and pulling it out a bit and you know making it the five one thing because i'd done quite a lot of five one mixes and stuff so um i got a lot more experience in that um but yeah it was great i mean it it's he's obviously great and he always surrounds himself with amazing people so you know the musicianship around him is always yeah the best so yeah. it's always a great thing to to hear what he's up to and, and to to hear the i part. think that is a very that that's not a, a that that is key to many many soul artists that people don't always think about like i think the the both the Amy and Adele albums are a great example. Like I know a lot of the musicians on that those albums personally. It's like right. unbelievable musicians. And it's I always think about it like kind of like almost like a Tarantino movie. Like the casting is just so dead on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm leaving the big stars uh, aside for a second. When you take someone on as a producer. Yeah. What do you what do you look for? What do you listen for? Uh, what I'm hearing for really is is will my involvement in this project make it better? You know, am am I the person to take? Do I understand what they're looking for, and can I deliver that? Am I the person that can take it forward? So, but but many many times the artist doesn't know what they're looking for. I mean, perspective is a fickle yeah a fickle fish yeah. So. Um, so obviously you, you kind of hear what their demos are or see a gig or something like that. And you get a sense of that. And then I sort of have a conversation about influences and things like that. So I can kind of join the dots between, okay, that's what I thought it sounded like. And they're into this band, this band and this band. So that makes sense. I can see where that's where the middle ground is. You know, I can see where, where we're sitting here. And sometimes there'll be, quite a long way towards a certain band and then it's i sort of see my job as drawing themselves out a little bit more it's like you know you you're too obviously a fan of this band we need to get more of you in it and then try and drag out some other influences because i'm more about finding out what what sort of stuff they're into because that's yeah. what they're naturally gonna be able to do because they've probably played those songs and they know those songs and things like that they know that sound and then it's the case of right let's let's lean it a bit more towards this band for this particular song and then you get more of their individual sound and 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 how long is that process for you is this pre-production is this in a studio tracking like what are we talking about yeah it's, it's all of it really so it starts off with the pre-production the pre-production is really about arrangement and how how's the song going to be structured because we need to know that before we put the drums down. I mean, you can obviously edit afterwards if you need to, but ideally you're not. And you're getting the drums down with everybody in as close to the final arrangement as you know as you can possibly as you you can see at that point. Um, and then when when you it's just when you're moving through the track and deciding what does it need next. You know, when you're doing all your overdubbing and you're choosing your guitar sounds and and if any of this kind of the big synths going to go on it and what sounds are we going to go for. And what sort of effects are we going to put on it? And then right through to the mix, you know, is, is it going to be, are the drums going to be right up in your face or they're going to be in the distance? And and is this supposed to be knocking you off your feet or is it supposed to be giving you a big hug or, you know, all of those sort of emotional decisions that you're making with each sound that you're bringing out, that all, that's all fed from what are the influences? What sound are we trying to make? You know, where does this artist fit? Where do they see themselves kind of almost like a who would they be supporting on a tour you know who would be a good support slot for them to for, for them to do because that's the kind of sound that they're making you know all those sort of things can can hopefully give you an idea of where the artist wants to be and, and deliver that no oh, that's fun. that's that's great that's great um any hobbies outside of music that you feel inform your music mm, that's a good question i don't know i tell you what i do like doing is i i, I like i like um I find it quite, quite, um, what's the word? Uh, a bit like meditating, sitting down and making synths. So a lot of what you see behind me, I've made. So you get like the PCBs. You, ah, you, you stole them to yourself? Exactly. Yeah, you get the PCBs ah. and then you have like, you, you buy a PCB and it gives you a list of like, resistor number one is 
a hundred K. So you sit there. Yeah. And if, like, did you ever do like painting by numbers as a kid where it's like number four is red. And I you, actually, you know, I used to do a lot of that with my dad when I was a kid, a lot of like soldering and fixing right. and building yeah. things. And, uh, and I keep having this fantasy that when we get together, we'll have time to make an app one day. Right. Right. But yeah. I don't see that happening because when I see my dad, we just, hang out, talk and eat. Yeah. So, and yeah, also yeah. time is becoming so precious. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's to have the, the, the three days to solve things. Yeah. But that's what I, often in the evening, I'll spend a couple of hours just doing a bit. What, what I feel is like painting by numbers, but it's just soldering resistors and capacitors into a board. And then end up with cool. at the end of it. So that's cool. Very, very cool. So just before I close this up, um, any for the younger younger kids watching this any any advice about about you know how to you know start this to become an you know an engineer or a producer of prominence what's wh how do you how do you how do you get in two, well two things one is um practice as much as you humanly can work with as many different people as you can because working with with different projects and different sounds every time it gives you a different skill every time you work with a different thing and you don't know necessarily what your what your your thing is going to be what your sound is going to be so like for me i tend to work with stuff that's quite organic and warm and and natural sounding with like you know real deal instruments and things like that now i got into it because i wanted to make pixies records that's not yeah. the sort of thing that i do anymore you know i'm not that kind of out and out guitar band stuff. I do things that are a bit more left field and a bit more um, interesting than that, or not interesting, but a bit more. Whoa, left field. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. No, that's that was the wrong word. Uh, it's not so much bread and butter drums, bass, guitar, vocal thing. There'll be more stuff. I think down also on. the world changed drastically since then. Yeah, that's Just true. The reality so changed. You don't know necessarily what your thing is going to be, so work with as many different acts and stuff like that as 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 you can, so you can get a more feeling of where where you actually enjoy going sonically as a producer or an engineer. So do that as much as possible and network as much as possible. It's an ugly word and it sounds very corporate, but it's just making friends. So if you say making yeah. friends, that sounds a bit less corporate, but do that and as much as possible because you don't know where your next gig's coming from, you know, or where yeah. the interesting gigs yeah. are coming from. So another question for the young kids, two or three albums of any in any time period that you think has the perfect mix that you think is like the Mount Rushmore of mixing Ooh. for your taste. Yeah. Okay. So Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Ah, that sounds amazing. Um, Underworld, Boku Fish. Hmm. You know that one? That sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know. I tend to just put on stuff I've been listening to lately. So I don't know what I would say is like, well, that one is, is, is unbelievable. You know what? I mean, I'm going to say, although it's weird, the Pixie Surfer Rosa, because ah. it's weird. And, and a very it's, specific sound. Yeah. Steve Albini doing a very specific thing about making four people sound massive and and it's odd, but I think it's a good thing to learn from. If you're into guitar music at all, yeah, um, it's really interesting what he did yeah, with that. Yeah, Albini is a huge guitar guy, and he's, yeah. he's a huge guy in any sense. Uh, yeah, and actually another one, I'm going to throw in a track which is Joy Division's Atmosphere, because that that one that one track, it sounds so huge. And even though it was made in what 1980, 1979, probably 78. It always sounds like it was done yesterday. It's quite yeah. a remarkable track, that. So, and that's Martin Hamnett, who was also a bit of a sort of maverick genius. But um, that's Amazing. an incredible sounding track. So, last question. Yeah. Artists that you always dreamed of working with, and it's in the wish list. What's the wish list like? Uh, you know what? I get asked that a lot, and I, I really should have one together, shouldn't I? I should have a list of people that a I think. Present, be... present company excluded. Of course, yeah, because that's <laughs> number one and always has been. Um, it would be, you know, who would be, I'd love to work with someone like Kate Bush. I think she would be fascinating to work with because she's just such an interesting character and, and wants to do interesting things. So, 
you know you and also a one in a million voice i mean you cannot yeah. mistake that voice yeah. yeah that would be incredible and you know you'd walk into the record and not know what sort of record you were going to be making yeah. it would just evolve as you went through and then it would be something incredible at the end and yeah and a chance to work with her singing would be second to none that would be amazing so yeah Perfect. that's kate bush all right man i'm i'm just so happy to you know be able to pick your brains for all this valuable uh bag of tips thanks so much for coming on um uh, you've been an inspiration in so many ways and i'm sure to many many people watching uh be safe be cool and you uh, and again just thank you and i'll take it back i'll bring it back to lewis in the studio lewis you there Sorry, sorry. And also, also thanks for sure to making the only mic that I would want to record guitars with ever. That had to be said. Thank you.